Trish asked me this week, what's it like to come back to the pulpit? And I said, it's like coming home to your beloved. So, um, hey. <laughs> the last time I preached, actually, I preached on that text, um, along with the story of Nicodemus. It was pride, it was the third week in June, and I was thrilled that Psalm 139 came up again in the lectionary, the schedule of texts that we use, because I could preach it every Sunday. You might not want to hear it every Sunday, but there's such good things in here. Today we're going to be thinking about what it means to be known and loved. Known and loved. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, your word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. So we ask now that you would make my words your words and speak into the hearts of your beloved the thing they need to hear today for a life of faith and a life of peace. Amen. I don't go to church when I'm not with you. My mom harasses me about that. But I either watch online or catch up on the sermons later because there's no place like middle. Amen. Amen. Sorry. Maybe it's the beach and maybe it's the woods, but it's not any other congregation I want to be in. When I'm gone, I miss our middleness. I miss the sights and sounds of what my friend Charles calls our everyness. It's the everyness of middle. There's no place else like it. So this summer, I had a chance to go back home to my childhood church. Much to my surprise, three of the stained glass windows in middle are in the Seventh Presbyterian Church in Chicago. That's Jesus. That's amazing. Um, and I had a chance to be there with my two-year-old niece, Rio, for her birthday. And we had a birthday party for her at a water park. Um, I've told you before that Rio is a screamer. Uh, but now she's two, and so she screams in full sentences. I don't want to get out of the water. I won't do it again loud. Put me in the water. I want macaroni and cheese and chicken in the water. Can I have <laughs> my baby doll in the water? The girl really enjoys the water. When I was home, my mom was looking really well, just looking great. Um, in fact, I sent some notes to some of you this week about how good mommy is. Good color, hair coming back, lost her appetite. But it turns out, just two days ago, we find out that my mom's cancer uh, has returned. And it's in her back now, uh, not in her lungs. So I'm leaving tonight to go to be with her tomorrow, to go to the first radiation treatment and to spend some time with her and my dad, uh, just to be with them, to help them, those who have cared for us, and now it's our time as children to care for them. You all know what that's like, right? When it turns around and it becomes our time. I'll hold her hand while she and daddy make plans about what to do next. And we'll pray. And my siblings and I will have a family meeting and figure out who'll do what. When something like this happens, it makes you think about your parents. Um, kind of like a retrospective, right? They are not perfect parents. In fact, there was a lot of screaming in our house. I'm pretty sure that Rio got the screaming gene uh, from mommy and daddy. Sorry, but it's true. They were not perfect, but boy, do they get an A for effort. Six children, six children. And they worked hard to give each of us the thing we needed at the time. We needed it. From baby formula to those nasty peas in the jar, from swing sets and jungle gyms to G.I. Joe and Barbie dolls. Off the record, I liked G.I. Joe much better than Barbie. We should talk about what that means sometimes. But her skinny little waist scared the daylights out of me. What's that about? What? Who can have that kind of waistline? Amen. Getting better. From curfews to cuddles, from piano lessons to guitar lessons, from basketball hoops to ballet classes. These parents from the Jim Crow South, from Mississippi's dark, racist soil, raised six children to be proud, 
and polite to persevere and pursue our dreams. They loved us with a powerful love, a demanding and exacting love. They raised us to believe in God and Jesus and ourselves because we were theirs. We were Lewis's, and that's what Lewis's do. Like that. Mommy's cancer's back, making me think about mommy stories, about how she could sleep through anything. One time, when we were really little, my sister and I got the bright idea to find her little Avon lipstick samples. Ooh, those were so, they were irresistible. There were not colors necessarily for black women. A little peachy, a little pink. <laughs> Just go there. A little chalky. But, but, oh, they were just the right size for our hands. We drew all over her face. Yeah. And on the oak headboard of her bed, baby girl slept through it all till daddy came home. Then there were some butt spankings and some screaming, and she woke up. One time, when I was about second grade, fourth grade, we had just moved to Chicago, and I spoke in the, the way I speak now, which was considered in those days to be proper talking. Anybody black in the room get accused of being proper? It's, it's a black thing, okay? But, but if, you, if you don't talk with the sort of ebonic moment, then you're, right, holla, then you're accused of being proper. Well, this little girl named Pam did not appreciate that at all. As dark as I am, she accused me of thinking I was white. What? <laughs> and she wanted to fight me, and she did several times. But one day, Mommy was like, oh, heck to the no, and <laughs> walked me to the school yard, found Miss Pam, put her hands on her hips, and said, if you touch my little girl again, you're going to be sorry you were born. No more fighting. No more fighting. When I was 15 and a junior in high school, I went through this phase that maybe teenagers go through, but I was a cocky little son. Had skipped a grade, didn't have nary a chest, wearing T-shirts when everybody else had bras. Uh, I, I, though, had long legs and was a sprinter, and I was bad to the bone. And my mother couldn't tell me anything. You know, she couldn't. None of you angels ever went through that, right? <laughs> so one day she said, I just can't tell you anything, can I? I was like, oh no, mommy, I'm, I'm present, I'm hearing you. But she was right. I was being arrogant and acting like she had no wisdom to share. I acted like I was smarter than my own mother who had brought me in the world. And she was smart, smart enough to see right through my act. She knew where my head was at, that I was acting like I was feeling cocky because, in fact, I was feeling very insecure, that all my friends knew about boys and had, were getting kisses and petting in the basement parties and, you know, with the black light. This is another black thing. When you're dark, the black light doesn't work for you. <laughs> So, um, yeah. So it wasn't that I was feeling confident. I was feeling shaky and afraid and like I wasn't quite right. And Mommy saw right through it. Thank God what she saw in me did not deter her, did not make her love me any less with my crazy little self. She still loved me. She still protected me. She saw everything about me, knew everything about me, and kept on loving me. When I was seven, she must have known that I was already feeling a call to do something in the church, to work for God. So when it was communion, and those delicious little cubes of sweet bread came by on a platter, passed down the row, and I took a piece of bread. She didn't talk to me about no broken bodies and blood and stab sides. She said, this means God loves you, no matter what. 
And then when those little delicious cups of Welch's grape juice, don't you love Welch's grape juice? When they came down the aisle, she didn't talk about shed blood and resurrection. She just said, this means God will never leave you, no matter what. God loves you and will never leave you. A simple sermon from a loving mom who didn't go to college, let alone theology school. Even more than she did, God loves me, she wanted me to know. Knows me, knows me, and will never leave me. The psalmist says it this way, Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up, you discern my thoughts from far away. You see me in the gym. Oh, I'm sorry, the psalmist didn't say that part. <laughs> you see me in the gym. You check me out on the yoga mat trying to do those poses. <laughs> Doing squats in front of the scandal television show. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. You see me on the subway, God, and in the airplane. You see the way I roll my eyes behind my boss's back. And you know how kind I am to my neighbor who is such a weasel. <laughs> but she doesn't have anybody else. Even before a word is on my tongue, oh, Lord, you know it completely. Those thoughts and dreams and hopes I have, the curse word I, I'm choking back right now, the play I'm writing, the deal I have to close. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand on me. You're guiding me in a pillar of light through the wilderness. You have my six, God. You have my back. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's too high for me to get. I can't understand it. I don't know what it means. I simply can't believe how fully you know me, how I can't hide from you. For it was you who formed my inward parts. You knit me together in my mother's womb. You are a weaver, God, and you put me together just like this with all of this goodness. And with all of my crazy town, all of the things I'm not proud of, you see it and you know it. I praise you for I am fearfully and awesomely and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, oh God, that I know very well. You made the universe and you made me just like this. My frame wasn't hidden from you when I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes beheld my unformed substance. In your book were written all of the days of my life, ordained all the days of my life, set out before me everything I would do. You ordained me to be a mom, a dad, an auntie, an uncle, a lover, a friend, a giver a taker, a mover, a shaker. I have a call from you, God, to be me, and it is no secret to you. How weighty are your thoughts? How vast are the sum of them? I try to count them, and they are more than the grains of sand. I come to the end of my life, and what is guaranteed is you will be there, and I will be with you. Friends, even more than mommies, God knows us inside out, everything about us. And here's what the problem is. We, like the psalmist, can deceive ourselves into thinking that because God knows all about us, we know all about God. God knows all about us, and so we think the transaction is we know all about God. There are four little verses in this scripture that never, ever, hardly ever get read in church because they're sort of, hmm. well, let me let you hear, and you tell me what you think. Those who speak of you maliciously and lift themselves up against you for evil, God, I want you to kill those folks, the bloodthirsty, 
Let them depart from me. Do I not hate them with a perfect hatred, those who hate you? Oh, yes, I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them as my enemies. What? We read this in staff the other day, and everybody went, whoop. This wonderful, loving affirmation of God and the psalmist and their intimate relationship and how much God has known, and then this stuff about killing the enemies of God. All of the scholars, they don't really want to deal with this. So what they say is that the psalmist is ending in an oath of loyalty. It, it ends in the words that the choir sang, search me, know me, see if there's anything wicked in me and lead me in your way. But in the middle of that, there's this place where the psalmist is trying to say, look, God, I'm your peeps. I'm yours. I've got your six. I'm going to hate everybody you hate, kill everybody you want to kill. Your enemies are my enemies. Now, the problem is, how do we know who the enemies of God are? Well, we don't. We just think we do. We just think we do because we think, you know, because God loves us so much, God probably loves someone less. God's not capable of loving everybody, after all, <laughs> exactly the same. So what we do is pretend that the mystery of God isn't that mysterious, and we start making stuff up. Right? Right? God is too high, the psalmist is right about that, to attain thoughts too lofty, too mysterious. Can't get God, so we have to make up some stuff. And what we make up is how God is like us, just like us. God hates who I hate. <laughs> God's uncomfortable with what I'm uncomfortable with. God can't stand what I can't stand, and the list starts happening. Um, mm, not clear about gay, because actually I had a couple homosexual thoughts. Okay, that's right. God hates gays. Let's put them out of the church. Uh, not really comfortable with black people, uh, even though they built the country. Let's put them in the balcony. <laughs> not really clear that the Native Americans understand their place. Let's put them on a reservation and take their land. Not really clear women should talk in church because who knows what they'll say. <laughs> Hello, let's not ordain them. Even though we say it's God's will, the Jews killed Jesus, so let's gas them. Oh, I'm sorry. The, the Muslims are not Christian. Let's pull out their fingernails and torture them into confessing Christianity. The Christians, yeah, they're infidels. Let's turn their planes into bombs and kill a bunch and knock the towers down. The problem is God knows all about us, and we don't know nearly enough, not nearly enough about God to decide who's good and who's bad and who's in and who's out and who's blessed and who's cursed and who's saved and who's not. The beginning of the end of a peaceful humanity is our arrogance. Like that 15-year-old flat-chested girl who thought she knew more than her mama. Sometimes there's an adolescent in us that thinks we know more than God. Okay, that's the bad news. The good news is, more than any earthly parent can, God knows even that part of us and is drawing us with such arms wide open love into a relationship in which we can stop being afraid, stop pretending like we know what we don't know, stop being arrogant when actually we're frightened children, 
Stop faking the funk and get authentic and say, God, please, please search me and know me and see if there's anything in me that needs to be cleaned up, shut down, confessed, twisted straight, tweaked to the left or the right, spanked in, stand stronger. <laughs> Lord, you know me and you love me. So fix me. It's a simple prayer to start our fall. Open up our chest. Get clean, clear, and candid about who we are. Show it to God and know that God loves you. I want you, um, in your bulletin, the kind of things to do things, we don't look at those, but I want you to look at them right now, right now. Open your bulletin. And one of them says, and I, I'm, this is kind of squishy for me because I'm not like that squishy girl, but I'm going to give you a squishy project. You know, affirmations and stuff. I have friends who give me little affirmations on cards. That's not really my thing. Put this in your mirror. But I'm asking you to put this in your mirror. <laughs> Just be a little squishy with me and find a way to put on your phone where you're going to look at an, like you can call it the I Love Me app. I don't know. But... More than anything that your mama or daddy or auntie or grandma or whoever raised you could tell you, one of my friends, big mom, told her all kinds of stuff, God loves you more than that. I want you to find a way to put in your mirror, in your phone, I am beloved. I am, what does it say, guys? Because I'm not going to read it. What does I it say? I am known and loved. Say that with me. I am known and loved. Not I'm a false, fake self and love, although that might be true. That's not what I'm talking about. Because you just can't pretend long enough. Pretty soon that stuff comes down. I am known and loved. One. Two. Somebody you know needs to know that too. A friend of yours, a partner, the cranky woman at work, the man who's always stepping on your foot at the subway, somebody needs to know they're known and loved. I want you to personalize a note and send a friend, a lover, a loved one. You are known and loved, dude. And you can say what else you want to say afterwards, like, therefore, you can. No, but I mean, you know. You are known and loved. It's a gift. It's a strength. It's a peak place of power from which to move. Three, and this is the hard one, one of your enemies needs to know they're known and loved. If we all be... They behaved as though we were known and loved. We wouldn't hate each other. The source of enmity is a lack of self-esteem. It's in Syria. It's in Egypt. It's in Chicago on the south side. One of your enemies needs to know that they're known and loved. They need to know that you are in the process of forgiving them. Don't lie. Again, we're not doing faking. Faking. But talk about where you are really in the process. I'm still mad at you, but God loves you and, and knows you, and I'm, I'm working on it. Can we have coffee? God loves you and knows you, and I'm, I'm just wanting to see if we can make it work. Three little projects to make the sermon live when you leave the room. Mommy has a little cancer, and so I can't help but think about how much she knows me how much she loves me, and how her human love doesn't even scratch the surface of what God can feel and does feel for all of us. You are known and loved by the Holy One. You can't hide it, and the good news is you don't need to. God bless and keep you. Amen.